The Holland City Council for February 1, 2023. I'm Mayor Nathan Box. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Kathy, would you please call the roll? Bird? Present. Freeman? Present. Peters? Here. Corbin? Here. Coronado? Here. Arnshorst? Hookstra? Here. Raymond? Here. Mayor Box? Present. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we're going to begin this evening's meeting as we have for many years. Uh, first, with an opening prayer this evening by Council Member Byrd, uh, followed immediately by the Pledge of Allegiance. And we would ask, invite you to join us if you're so inclined. I ask you all to pray with me. Dear Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts. We thank you for life. We thank you for life in Holland. We thank you through for the life that you have given us through Jesus Christ. Father, as we deliberate today, I pray for wisdom, guidance, and direction, and the words that need to be spoken that they are spoken today. Lord, I pray over this country that we live in today for unity. In a time of heavy division, deep division, we need guidance on how to unite. We need direction on how to unite, and we need a heart of being united as one, United States of America. So I just pray for unity from Holland in our individual homes all the way across this country. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next are our consent agenda items. These are items that are considered to be fairly routine. They have been previously reviewed by council members as part of our packet, and they will be enacted in one motion unless a member of the public or a member of council asks to have an item removed from the consent agenda and placed in its regular order on the regular agenda. Uh, but before I ask that, Kathy, would you please review the consent agenda for us? 4A, approval of minutes, January 18th, 2023 regular meeting and January 21, 2023 retreat. 4B, absence excused. 4C, oaths of office. 4D, <coughs> claims filed against the city. 4E, approve facility encroachment agreements with CSX Transportation in support of the 6th Street Reconstruction Project. 4F, approve budget for engineering work on the Van Ralty Avenue project. 4G, approve budget for engineering work on the 16th Street project. 4H, approval of full steam software for reservation system payments. 4I, October financial reports. 4J, PA 198 tax abatement, set public hearing for February 15, 2023. MG88 Holland Cold Storage. 4K Windmill Island Gardens declare items as surplus. 4L intent to create a neighborhood enterprise zone. 780 Columbia Avenue adopt resolution of intent. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Is there any member of the audience that would like to have an item removed from the consent agenda and placed on its regular place in the regular agenda? Seeing none. Any member of council that would like to have an item removed from the consent agenda? Your Honor. Mr. Hookstra. Yes, I would <clears throat> request that item 4L, as in Lincolnberry, be removed from consent. All right, and then that will be placed at item 12E 6.3 on the regular agenda. Uh, anyone else like to remove something from the consent agenda? Seeing none, what is the pleasure of council in regard to the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented with the exception of letter L. Great. Moved, moved by Vreeman. Is there support? Support. S support by Coronado. Any discussion? Seeing none, Kathy, would you please call the roll? Bird? Yes. Vreeman? Yes. Peters? Yes. Corbin? Yes. Coronado? Yes. Hookstra? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, next is an opportunity for public comment. Under the uh, Open Meetings Act of the State of Michigan, we provide the opportunity for the public to address council or any of our boards, committees, and commissions uh, at our public meetings. Uh, we do have some rules regarding public comment. Your comments are limited to five minutes. Please address council only. Uh, you can speak on any subject that you want to, but this is one-way communication. It's an opportunity for you to speak to us. Uh, we don't engage in discussion at this time, nor do we answer questions at this time, uh, but it's an opportunity for you to speak on anything that you think is important. Uh, there are three lights on the dais in front of me, a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. Uh, the green light means you're doing well on time. The yellow light means that you have one minute left. And the red light means that your time has expired. Uh, when you approach the dais, uh, excuse me, when you approach the microphone, please state your name and the municipality that you live in. Uh, with that being said, is there anyone here who would like to address council at this time? If so, please come forward. And would you please state your name and municipality for the record? Ann Henriksen, Zealand. I was talking to a woman last week that I did not know. She called me by name. How did she know me? She said she and her husband and friends watched the City of Holland meetings online. It dawned on me that's why I'm here, not to be known, but for those watching online. It is my hope that they would express their views in emails and in person. It is their right that you know what they think. The majority of the newly elected Ottawa County uh, commissioners were voted in by the public regardless of how the Sentinel skewed the numbers of votes. The public desired a change in the direction of the past Ottawa County government. 2020, the Holland Sentinel reported a large group of parents came into the Ottawa County commissioners meeting to try to get their children back in school during the COVID pandemic. They were con concerned about masks and the unnecessary Ottawa County Health Department's restrictions. Education was and is essential. The past commissioners disregarded their efforts, allowing only 10 people in the room with just two minutes to speak. Thus, the Ottawa, Ottawa impact was formed as the voice of the people to support our children and families. So the public voted the present 2023 commissioners. They are faithfully doing what they promised the voters they would do. Who put the DEI department in the Ottawa County government? The public? No, it was the previous commissioners. Last fall, an educational, um, an editorial appeared from a woman and her partner needing sex education for their child from the county health department. It was not available. I suspect, as usual, it had been put in place in the first place by the DEI department. Other parents requested information, saw what it entailed, and asked for it to be removed. It could have been the same parents who wanted the book Gender Queer removed from the Jamestown Library. Again, I suspect the Ottawa County Health Department adopted Planned Parenthood instruction for the same sex sexual engagements. Planned Parenthood's motto is, kids are going to do it anyway, might as well instruct them how to do it safely. Our children are not animals. I ran across an article in 2019 about the Planned Parenthood sex curriculum for children. These words that come to mind is, just sexualize them. You may remember 2018, the Sentinel published a, a citizen editorial about a yard sign they saw, Jesus is Lord over Ottawa County. The citizen said the sign discriminated. She proceeded to comment that because we have an Ottawa County DEI department, such a sign should be prohibited without directly saying it, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, in, intimates that a display of faith should not be allowed. The DEI label is continuing to be seen for what it is, an ideology that brings about division, then exclusion of people of faith. Now the Sentinel calls these people faith, Christian nationalists. The fact that the county DEI department no longer exists does not mean that the sexually orientated people are not welcome. All people are protected by the laws of anti-discrimination. The patriotic slogan, let freedom ring, is the will of the people for all families. It does not mean that some are not welcome. Thank you, Mayor Box, for your commitment, com comments to the Sentinel article, County Commissioners Shake Up Could Stymie Business. You carefully navigated the issue. 
you did not get into the Sentinel's bias melee about trying to remove the 2023 commissioners. You spoke wisely and firmly of what Holland stands for and governs with. All are welcome here, including the people of faith. The Holland DEI ordinance should be more rightly identified as the anti-discrimination ordinance as you originally voted it. Perhaps the public should exercise their rights as citizens to email the council and recommend the change. The DEI label should be changed and the anti-discrimination title reinstated. We love our country, our county, and this city. We are the people who pray and vote for the government that guarantees its citizens to live peaceful and quiet lives mar marked by godliness and dignity. First Timothy 2, 2. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? And would you please state your name and your municipality for the record? My name is Michael Perry uh, from Holland. Um, <clears throat> I remember back in 1960, well, I didn't live during that time, but back in 1960, 1963, um, laws were changed to um, not teach the Bible in school for one and two was, uh, the other was uh, dealing with prayer, um, which dealt with a minority of the United States that really wanted that to take place. Not saying that the minority is not important. They are just as much important as the majority. Mm -hmm. However, the reason for it was that they did not want things being taught to their children that they didn't want taught, which they have every right. However, um, now throughout the United States, this book that was just previously mentioned, Gender Queer, is being put in schools without parental consent. I don't know if any of you have read this book or looked through this book, but I can show you pages in here where uh, I found disturbing that they were in this book because if my child went to a book with a pornographic material or hentai, which is Japanese comic porn, they would be expelled from school. They would be suspended, no doubt, no question. Um, in here, they show a little boy and a little girl peeing outside. Um, there's another portion in the book to where they showed two men laying in bed nude, making out. They show another here where um, there's a young lady in here um, masturbating, licking her own fingers afterward. Um, then they show another... Uh, <laughs> I could, all the pictures are in here. They show off a, a young lady, frontal nude. Um, they show a young lady with a strap on, or a dildo that's strapped on with another young lady with her mouth on it. But they're putting this in public schools throughout the United States. And I know a lot of people that are not in approving of it, but it's still getting in. Um, Funny how indoctrination works is that if you want kids to smoke, give them candy cigarettes. You want them to start chewing tobacco, give them big lead chewing gum. You can be like, you can be like your stars or people that you look up to. Um, and I see this in that same formal way. I, I wouldn't want my children to have access to this book. Uh, but here is being put in public schools without parental consent. The Bible was taken out of school primarily because they don't want their kids to be indoctrinated with that. That's fine. But why would ours be indoctrinated with this? I don't get it. We have the freedoms to believe and do as we please, but why are these being taught to our children? That want to be allowed, allow the Bibles back in school. It's, to me, it's just common sense. We can indoctrinate on one topic, but not another. Let them both be permitted, or neither. 
that'd be fine with me as well. I mean, I'm always going to believe in God regardless, and I'll train up my, my, my children, my family, or whomever in, in the things that I believe. If that's what you choose to do, that's fine. However, I don't understand why a book like this is in school. If my child went with hentai or pornographic material in their school, they would be expelled. No questions asked. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? And would you please state your name and municipality for the record? Yes, my name is Araceli Zuniga, and I live in Holland, Michigan, North Side. And um, first of all, I would like to appreciate and thank each and every one of you, uh, Mayor, Mayor Box, and uh, City Council. Thank you for serving our city, you know, so well, and uh, considering every, every voice matters in, in Holland, I believe. And you guys are proving that by even uh, declaring April Faith Month. And so we, we really, really, the community of Holland is spreading um, to reaffirm our faith in Holland, Michigan. And so thank you for um, allowing us to celebrate in April. So we're, there's plans being made, um, you know, in the community of faith. And um, I believe that uh, Holland has a history of... Um, of faith, you know, uh, uh, the intentions of how it was built on, on Judeo-Christian principles. And I believe we're coming back to that and re, re, um, reaffirming it and reigniting the fire of, of our faith in God. In God we trust, and, I, and we encourage you guys in your moments of desperation or, or needing wisdom, you know, from God to, to call upon him. Amen. Because he will guide you to to uh, to build this city and uh, build it with the with the intention of, you know, all lives matter. Amen. All lives matter. People of faith are here to stay. And um, we've been investing in Holland, our churches. You know, I'm familiar with the, the Reformed churches and the Pentecostal uh, Baptist. You know, we've been around, you know, all kinds of religion and um, Judeo-Christian, basically that center, centers on Jesus Christ, amen, and, and being uh, exalted in our city. And um, I know some of you guys uh, come from, you know, Christian background too. And so we're just grateful that God's spirit is moving among us. And I was brought up in a family of uh, 12 children, and my dad, you know, worked as hard as he could, never, never, um, uh, you know, in a Christian home, never asking for help, you know, from the, from, um, the department, you know, that, that give out, you know, handouts. But we worked hard in this city, and, and we, we've come so far and in be, trying to be good citizens of Holland, Michigan. And we love our city. We love our leaders and we pray for our leaders. We may not agree with everything that you guys do pass, just like you know the previous uh, people that came up here to express, but purity, guys, can I say guys? Purity is how we were brought up with. Making a, a, as much as possible a child to, to maintain its, his purity, you know? Purity is separating ourselves from from anything that could harm them or that could, um, you know, open their eyes too soon, you know, for for the things that adults do, you know, as far as, you know, anything, uh, you know, as far as drinking or even in the sex, sex area. So purity, my dad brought us up that we need to, God calls us to purity, you know, purity matters because it keeps our children safer, amen, to be more responsible, to, to be brought up healthier, with healthier minds, you know. And so if these books that, uh, uh, you know, that they were mentioning here, uh, a book, and there might be more, can open the eyes and, and, and the thoughts that are not pure, you know, we need to remove things that, that can harm our children. 
and open their eyes. I mean, pornography is not allowed, right? You know, legally, it's not allowed at a certain age. So we need to, you know, pass better laws that, that protect our children, you know, and remove anything that could, you know, that could uh, harm a child psychologically uh, and seeing things that they're at their age, they're not capable of comprehending. So, um, so my request is we need to possibly bring those books that- Mr. Mayor, that's five minutes. Yes. I'm sorry, your time has okay. expired. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council at this time? Seeing none, I will close the public comment period. Uh, next item on our agenda this evening, uh, item number nine, written petitions and communications. Uh, in addition to providing the opportunity for the public to speak to us directly uh, and in person at our meetings, we do also have an email address uh, that you can use to send comments to the entire city council. And that is public comment at cityofholland.com public comment at cityofholland.com. Uh, we do not read those emails at our meetings, but we do uh, review them in between and then we accept them into the record. We do not have any this this evening. I do know one came late this afternoon and I had mentioned to the, the commenter, it might not make it onto the agenda for today, but it'll be there next go around. So if you sent an email and you don't see it here on the agenda today, that's because it was past the deadline for being able to get it on the agenda today. Uh, but it will be next time. Uh, but we do not have any uh, this evening. So the next item in the agenda, uh, item number 10, 10A, Planning Commission, text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance, the or the UDO, round seven. Mr. Van Dyken. Yes, thank you. Uh, this evening we're lucky to have, looks like pretty much all of our planning staff here with us uh, tonight, so that's great. I think Steve is going to be leading the charge on the uh, corrections, modifications, recommendations that are coming through through the Planning Commission to Council. Uh, and I, with that, I will let Steve dig in a little further into those uh, modifications. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Yes, we're going to go through Udo round seven here. So these are some of the changes and tweaks that we've been making. These first couple in the packet, uh, again, are what I would probably describe as being a little bit more substantial. And then as we get through this uh, packet of amendments, they become a little bit more uh, of maybe the common corrections and uh, I think Keith used the word recalibration at the last meeting, so a little bit of all of that, but these first couple are a little bit more uh, substantial. Uh, the first one on the screen here is in the planning and development section of the code. Um, you can see we are um, rewriting that paragraph F uh, to be a little bit more um, wordy. Um, this is the planning and development section, and the planning and development, really the concept of that set of regulations is we want to have a mechanism that would allow for, uh, you know, maybe some different, some more creative, some flexible approach to developments that may not fit exactly into the code uh, the way it's written. We, of course, have many uh, planning new developments right now. Um, but with the uh, rewrite of UDO, uh, we really felt like uh, in order to be able to waive really just about any section of uh, of the document, we wanted to create some standards that would give the city, the planning commission, the authority to do that. So that's really what you see uh, written here. Um, and then you see six different standards, A through F, um, not to read through those, uh, but those are standards really that you've been using already. Those are standards that are in those existing PUDs that you have um, done. So we really just kind of pulled from that and, and put this in the document uh, to give you the ability to do uh, those sorts of waivers. Of course, as you know, you have the ability, or, or the city does, the Planning Commission, um, to make some waivers right now, uh, but we do that by specifying you know, which section, maybe it's a parking or maybe it's setbacks. So again, rather than identify in a, for a PUD, the, the idea of identifying each section that they might be able to waive, this was a way that you would be able to, uh, the Planning Commission would be able to uh, look at the entire project and really alter uh, the regulations. The second one is the accessory dwelling unit. So this is a set of uh, changes that came, it's a little bit different. This came from the Neighborhood Improvement Committee who 
um, was studying this uh, over a period of time, kind of looking at um, really, I think it started with just the fact that there isn't a lot of accessory dwelling units. And so what maybe some of the challenges um, and so they were looking at our code in relationship to some of the model ordinances and some of the other cities around the state. Um, and through that process, they forwarded a set of recommendations to the Planning Commission to consider. Uh, this is the result of that. I would tell you that uh, the, first, the first sort of introduction of those changes to the Planning Commission, it was um, there was a lot more that the uh, Neighborhood Improvement Committee was was recommending we they had talked about allowing for some attached accessory dwelling units um, modifying the size uh, modifying the occupancy limit um, eliminating the metering uh, the separate metering requirement um, and although it wasn't a recommendation they did um, kick around this idea of maybe altering that uh, uh, hope neighborhood hope overlay district boundary because uh, they're not allowed adus are not allowed in that boundary so there was some discussion about um, uh, whether to move that boundary i guess i just give you that in the context of that that's kind of what came up from the from the nic committee and really what the planning commission um, took a look at and said you know um, they were really only interested in in looking at changes that might alter the size and occupancy limit um, from the ADU uh, for the ADU regulation so that's really what you have in front of you so try to trying to explain this chart that you've got here um, this tier one I guess I would describe as that's essentially the current regulations that we have for ADUs with some exceptions that you see kind of highlighted in yellow there um, reducing the minimum size from 300 to 200 square feet so the minimum size of an adu could go down to 200 square feet and then for that uh, not to exceed uh, size uh, for the adu you see the 35 percent that's a small change originally uh, we used the fraction of a third so really the idea there was just to go to the percentage but it is a change from essentially 33 percent to um, no more than 35% of the gross floor area of the principal dwelling unit above grade. So that's a cap on how big uh, the ADU could be. The 720 square feet is what that um, is what the allowance is right now. So that that overall square footage isn't changing. And then finally, the change on that tier of uh, three people maximum. Uh, right now it's two. So the idea was that maybe if there was a family there that you would have the allowance for an additional person um, in that uh, accessory dwelling unit. And then expanding on that, again, kind of talking about this, the Neighborhood Improvement Committee's idea of um, um, altering the size, the idea was to allow for a little larger accessory dwelling unit. So in that tier two, in order to qualify for that, first of all, you have to be uh, a minimum of 9,600 square foot lot, 60 feet wide. Those numbers come from our uh, TNR zoning district for our duplex allowances. That's where those numbers come from. So if you qualify for that, uh, the minimum, or I should say the maximum size for an ADU would increase from 720 square feet to 800 square feet. So an 80 square foot increase if you were on one of those uh, lots that was at least 9,600 square feet. And then you can see a not to exceed number of 50% of the gross floor area. So again, if you had a larger home, just because your 50% might be 2,000 square feet, you can't have a 2,000 square foot accessory dwelling unit. It would cap at that 800 square feet. And then finally, uh, increase in occupancy to four uh, people. So that's, that's how you read that chart. Those are the changes that we made. Um, and then just underneath that, you see there is a reference to the city code about the uh, occupancy, the size, the square footages. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that was in there so that you still have to comply with those minimum uh, requirements. So for example, by increasing the maximum occupancy for ADUs, uh, let's just use the four people, um, you can't have, you, you couldn't 
have just a 200 square foot accessory dwelling unit to, to be compliant with those regulations um, you would be up to 470 square feet for four people so really that that um, allowing down to that 200 square feet that would essentially allow for the ones and twos uh, occupancy and then as you get bigger um, then you can have uh, uh, that larger occupancy so just to make sure we're clear on that just because maybe you would be eligible for that four people if it was a smaller ADU, you, you might not be able to, to still do that. So you still have to meet the city requirements for the size of a, um, a, a unit, a residential unit. Then you do see some edits um, uh, underneath that, kind of reorganizing some of, the, um, some of the rest of the requirements, but they're the same. We struck out that uh, line and in uh, sentence five there talking about the maximum of two people um, shall occupy the ADU because we have that uh, in the chart and that the ADU shall not be sold separately. But then we just, when we reorganize that, that's over on that right hand side under letter G. Um, and then we wanted to make sure it was clear that uh, although we still require the one parking space for residential unit, we wanted to make sure that that was in uh, that section so it was clear to everybody so they didn't have to go back and look at uh, the tables that we have. You also do see a, a small edit there just a, a little bit above in that line C. Um, that's just an edit that needs to come out because that um, section that it's referring to 905 B1 there is no B1 so that is just coming out it's just supposed to refer to 905. So I know that was a lot, but we spent some time talking about the accessory dwelling units at the last meeting. Do questions at the end yeah. or? Yeah, you want, it's, yeah, that's up to you. You want to, does anybody have questions under this section? Go ahead, Mr. Corbin. Sure. Thank you. Um, so where to begin? <laughs> so if, if for some reason, if item five, we weren't to accept the changes in item uh, e5 it would be redundant to repeat that in 6g correct As, right so that would be stricken if we didn't accept and e5 correct yeah I, I guess you're right if you okay. didn't adopt these that then five just stays the way it is that red line just comes out yes there may be some of these things maybe some areas which we would accept but uh, others we may not I don't know what the feelings of the board is at this point um, item H um, so is that the normal parking um, yes limitations for a single family is one car per single family yeah. correct okay that, that's the limit it says one additional parking so it's just requiring one additional parking above and beyond what right okay yeah the ADU is requiring the one additional space and you clarified the item E, uh, yeah, E3, let's see, E3, no, item E6C, where you scratched off B1. It's just referring back to the appropriate section. Yeah, there, there just simply is no B1. Yeah, that just needs to come out. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this portion? Okay, great. Let's keep going. All right. Uh, the GMU, this is the uh, Greenfield Mixed Use uh, Zoning District. Um, you can see kind of highlighted there in the northeast corner of the city in blue. Um, this is a zoning district. We're talking about uh, maximum building height here. So on that left side of that page, you see all of the building heights uh, uh, by the zoning district. GMU is limited to 35 feet. Um, what we're finding is that particular area south of 16th Street, essentially 16th to 24th, east of Waverly, has got some challenges to it. There is a lot of low land there, and in order to get any kind of development in there, it really appears that um, height is going to be needed. So taking a look at kind of what is around this piece of property, you can see all the different zoning districts just kind of working um, around there, maybe um, counterclockwise, uh, on 16th Street, that orange is the HDR zoning district that has an allowance of 45 feet right now. The red 
Uh, the corridor mixed use to the west is uh, allows for a 50 foot height limit. Um, you do see some of that purple there. Those are the PUDs that are out there. That's the home flats and the Rust Haven project. Uh, PUDs actually allow for six stories or more, uh, depending on uh, you have the flexibility to allow for even greater height. And then that gray is the industrial zoning district, which allows for 60 feet uh, with the ability to go to 100 with a special land use permit. You do see some yellow there. That's the LDR district, and that's limited to 35 feet uh, as well. Um, but again, based on um, some of the challenges with this property, it's a small uh, geographic area and what's around it. We are, the recommendation is to raise the GMU height limit to 45 feet uh, by right and the ability to go to 60 feet with that special land use. So kind of taking a little bit from the industrial zoning district and repeating it here with just some different numbers. To give you some context, this is the Rest Haven project that's under construction right now. A couple of their larger buildings in the, in the area, kind of southeast corner of their site. Uh, this is allowed to be at 57 uh, feet, a little bit taller than 57 feet. Uh, and this is the Home Flats project, which is right on Waverly and 24th Street. And that was permitted at a little over 52 feet tall. So again, um, we think it's consistent with what we've approved around it already. And for instance, these two projects would, have, would be permitted um, with the special land use um, with these changes. This is a, uh, a picture of the overall zoning map and trying to highlight uh, around the airport. You can kind of see at the west end of that green area um, is a circled area that is some property that has just recently come in uh, to the city. And uh, we do a really good job in our ordinance of telling uh, what the zoning will be when it comes into the city. But we, we need to make sure that we also include those airport overlay lines. So those are the, bl the black heavy lines that uh, are surrounding the airport that have some different regulations. Um, so when that property comes in, uh, the zoning changes to LDR, but we need to make sure that that airport overlay district is also included um, on, this, uh, on these couple maps that we reference in here as well. Form-based code section. So this is our table of uses, and you can see there are several special land uses that we simply um, omitted the section that it gets uh, referred to, that 4.03 simply needs to apply to all of those special land uses uh, in the form-based district table. Staying in the form-based code, uh, we want to change the language. We talk about vehicle door, and we would really like to change that to garage door. We think that will avoid a little bit of confusion. Um, and you can see there's several, there's four pages that have similar changes on it, all in the form-based code. Staying in the form-based code, um, one-story building height. So um, we're trying to make it sure that it's clear here that the, uh, for new buildings, you have to be 16 feet tall. There is some clarification on how we're doing measuring. Uh, that's really just trying to clarify what's in there already. So new buildings would be 16 feet tall. And then if you have an existing one-story building that's not 16 feet tall, it just kicks you to the non-conforming section of the code, which is the next edit. Um, and so what we're trying to make sure is a little more clear here is for buildings that would, one-story buildings that are existing that aren't 16 feet tall, if they wanted to expand, um, maybe do an addition off the side of the building, that they wouldn't have to, let's say, raise their roof one foot or two feet in order to meet that 16 foot height requirement, that they would be allowed to maintain uh, that same height that they have. And, and you see that same thing um, in regards to maximum setback. So in an area where we have a few maximum setbacks where we don't we're trying to get the buildings closer. We don't want them pushed too far back. We have a maximum setback in it. So if you are further behind than that, and if you wanted to do an addition, you would be able to do that um, 
if you just maintained that same setback. So you didn't push it back any further. If you just maintained your same line, your same setback, that you would be able to do that. So what really what this does is it enables somebody to just keep what they have without having to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals or to get a waiver uh, for setbacks. The example that we used was the uh, recent addition to the family video site where they had to do both of those items. Uh, this would have prevented, this would allow them to prevent having to do the Board of Appeals um, and the waiver requirement to just keep the same setback and the same height that they already had. A couple more. Self-storage facilities, uh, we are just adding that RMU zoning district as a district where they're permitted. That's already, they're already permitted in that district. It was just left off this list. Building clear vision corner. Um, putting into section 915, which is what you see on the lower right-hand side, um, for buildings that have a zero to three foot front setback, that they have to have um, some sort of clear vision um, component of the building um, so that you don't have you know, either cars, um, but most probably more importantly, um, bikes, walkers. Um, and we have a lot of examples of that kind of stuff downtown where maybe the corner of the building is clipped um, so you can see around a corner. Doesn't mean that you couldn't have a column supporting something, but. Uh, maybe the corner of the building uh, is just cut off so that you can see around a corner. Um, and then there's also a reference in there to 3.17, um, which is our corner treatment requirement in our form-based code that you could, by meeting one, you might actually be able to just meet both requirements at the same time. Accessory structures allowed and required setback. So in for, for residential, um, uh, dwelling units, one to four dwelling units. Uh, we have a limit on the number of accessory structures that you can have. Um, and really what this is telling you is that there's gonna be some features like uh, porches and stairs and patios and decks that we are not going to count as accessory structures. So wanted to make sure that that's clear. Um, that reference that we were talking about earlier in the ADU section was referring back to the same thing that an, an ADU would certainly count, uh, but there's gonna be some other things that we simply wouldn't want to count as an accessory structure. So I wanna make sure that's clear. Cleaning up that uh, section about eaves, uh, eaves may project three feet from the wall and be set back at least two feet. So cleaning that up, because that's really what uh, the regulations were before uh, we did UDO, so just really putting that back to the way it was. Uh, we talked a little bit already about waivers um, that we allow for. We do have some specific standards in the form-based code about waivers, so we want to make it sure when we're want to we want to make sure it was clear when we're talking about the standards that uh, the planning commission uh, may be using. Um, that if it's in the form-based code, you're going to go, you're going to use those standards in the form-based code. So that's the reference back to the. 3.15 for the F district. So standards are a little bit different. We don't want to confuse which ones we're going to use. Special land use amendments. So this is a change that would allow for smaller projects uh, that would normally be reviewed by the zoning administrator. We kind of have those three columns, the zoning administrator, the administrative review process, and then planning commission. So right now, um, for um, site plans that um, involve a special land use project, um, they would only be allowed to be reviewed by that administrative review process or the planning commission. By adding that 12.04, that would allow for the zoning administrator review to also uh, take place. Example I used is we recently had a church in the industrial zoning district, which is a special land use. They had a very small uh, addition, 1,000 square feet. That would normally be a zoning administrator type review, um, but it was kicked to the administrative review process. Um, so we would like to be able to have that zoning administrator review for small projects um, 
even though that may be a special land use if it's just a site plan amendment. And you can see in that, in those standards, there's still an evaluation of whether or not it would change the nature or intensity of the use. So I suppose it's possible that you could still have a small project, but one that we felt would still be uh, enough to change that intensity of the use would still get kicked up, if you will. Um, so it doesn't automatically mean that it would be that zoning administrative view, but it would uh, allow for that um, option to take place. And then over on the left-hand side, we were um, kind of keeping with the streamlining process that we have with Udo. Um, don't think it's necessary to have the planning commission as part of that review process because if, if we had to wait to take it to the planning commission and then find out that it could be admin or zoning administrator, then you know, you'd go to the planning commission and they'd say, no, we don't need to see it. And now we've already you know, spent a bunch of time. So we think um, uh, just by having staff do that evaluation, um, that that's a little bit more efficient and, and uh, more streamlined, uh, which is really what we've been really doing with Udo. Finally, last one. Um, just some changes to the fair housing accommodation section. Uh, you can just see just some edits, some clarifications, and some reformatting as a result of making some of those changes. Those are all of the UDO 7 changes. That is what the Planning Commission has recommended um, for approval for you. Um, I'm sure you wanted to spend some time talking about, in particular, the ADU. I guess. I just maybe want to end by saying um, you certainly have the ability to approve what's been recommended. You could approve it without the ADU uh, recommendations. Um, I guess I'm just wanting to maybe put my two cents in and say if you were going to try to you know, rewrite and craft different language for that ADU, uh, my recommendation would be to approve the document, don't approve the ADU send that back to the planning commission to to study that if if that's what you would like to do i just i'd be afraid i i may not be able to have all the best answers for you if we just started sort of designing on the fly is all so that's my two cents all right great thank you uh questions for staff yeah Lynn. um so i i sort of remember when we were going through the UDU process that we deliberately left out pdu pdu pud language um, but it's, it seems like there are a lot of municipalities that have that in their, in their ordinances. It, is that, it's pretty common to, to have that kind of process in, that, that you're proposing here, this process? Um, well, we didn't leave it out of oh. the, I mean, we, we certainly have the PUD in, in the document. Um, and to answer the second part of your question, yes, I, I would say that I think that's very normal to have the ability to, to do the waivers and exceptions, um, at least that's been my experience. That's really the point of having the mm -hmm. the PUD ability to do those. So um, that's new. That the the red the red line section is not new. Well, it's new language for the UDO. Yeah. 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 We really felt um, and really working with the city attorney's office, if we were going to, you know be able to grant exceptions or waivers or this flexibility that we really needed to develop some standards mm -hmm. in order to be able to do that. Or you were really only going to be able to do exceptions to the things that we have in, mm -hmm. in the document. And that might not be everything that, that, not be that you would want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh. And Steve, just to follow up on that, that, that language, I think you said in a, in a previous meeting where we discussed that those standards are the standards that we were using in the city pre-UDO, is that correct? Yeah, we, we, you're right. We really did pull that from some of the existing uh, developments that we've already done, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Great. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Jake. Go ahead. Steve, how, it turns out when, when we started this conversation years ago about enhancing housing, we had a lot of discussion about what are the tools we have and ADU at the time, before we even started thinking about it, what it looked like, we thought that appeared to be a thing that might help us create comfortable density in our town and have more people be able to live here. Um, <clears throat> in the reality of trying to 
do ADUs the way we've done them to date, how many do we have? I think uh, seven or eight. Seven or eight. In, in how many years? I think Five. since 2015. 2015? Yeah, 2015. So seven years. We have seven. Seven. One a year. Um, any blowback, any bad thing, anybody have any negative reaction to that as these things have kind of unfurled in people's yards and neighborhoods? Has there been any complaints? I have not. I have not heard that. Okay. When I'm on the Neighborhood Improvement Committee, and, you know, their job, probably more than any other, is to think about neighborhoods and people, and they talk about how do we improve our neighborhoods, and the big th talk is we need more places to live. Um, I know that the, the list that we came to the plant had to be approved by the Planning Commission was a bit longer, but the thought process that I think went into what we have here is saying, do we think that ADU is a strategy? And if we do, um, I think the Neighborhood Improvement Committee, through their dialogue of experience and living with people and just knowing how the, the city when the world works, um, maybe if we could tweak the ADU, it might apply to more people. So I'm wondering, in your mind, if we make these changes, um, do we have any reason to believe that we're gonna go from seven to 55 in five years? It's a good question. I, I, I probably would say I, I wouldn't believe that. Um, it's kind of a yeah. question for my example, I guess. Yeah. Um, to me, these things always felt like a way to have density and really in a way for people to live in their home and want to stay in their home. One of the reasons why part of the Hope College, asking Hope College to be part of that was what drove part of the, part of the discussion was a gentleman who lived on 12th on the uh, south side of Collin Park, or uh, Centennial Park, in a home he'd lived there for, fifth, for 10 years. And he was building a garage. And the garage was exactly the right size. Um, and he wanted to do an ADU, but they said, well, you can't, they're not allowed where you live. And, I, and when I spent some time looking at his project, uh, just thinking that, that's exactly where we want an ADU. He wants his, he literally wants to have his mother-in-law live there when she gets older. And it's a big house and it's a nice sized garage and it was the perfect location. But I understand that there's concern <coughs> about whole college and density with all of that. But you know, the Neighborhood Improvement Committee put a lot of time and effort and thought into this. And I have no reason to believe that tweaking this might garner a few more ADU units and have a few more places for people to live in, in town comfortably and not put in jeopardy the, the neighborhoods that, uh, that with all the, the negative connotation that might come with, oh my God, he's gonna put an ADU in his ba backyard, there's gonna be too many, or it's gonna be in the wrong neighborhood. I think you've got the rules in place. So I, uh, having been privy more to that neighborhood of discussion about what do we need and how can we improve people's lives, and this might be an opportunity, I'll certainly fall more in line with that than than uh, all the rules I think that the Planning Commission is obligated to pay more attention to because their focus is a little different, but I'm, I'm, I'm good with this. So thanks for, the, thanks for the work on it. Any other questions for staff? Yeah, just, Red, a, Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, just yeah. a clarification, Steve. So we received an email from somebody who was a little bit concerned about the second tier project and what um, she said was that um, uh, if there was a 3,000 square foot house on a 9,600 square, 9, square foot lot, they would be able to build a 1,500 square foot ADU. But according to this, it couldn't be any bigger than 800 square feet. Am I correct about that? That's right, yeah. that's right. You still, you, have to, you kind of have to beat both of those, right? Exactly. So the cap is uh, 800. Yeah, regardless of the size of the, it right. has to be 800. It has to be, it can't be any bigger than 800. And if it's under that 9,600 square feet, then the cap is 720. Right. Any other questions for staff? You want to get a motion on the? Okay. Anything else for staff? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I um, 
I was going to add to what Jay said, but now I can't remember what I was going to say. It'll come back to me. So you do have some questions, well, Mr. Well, Corbett. Maybe not questions. I'll do do some commentary. Like my well, I want to I want to hold chair. off on I want to I want to hold off on commentary and discussion until we've got a motion on the floor. This this is an opportunity for for staff to report and for us to. Okay, well, I'll ask them some questions then. Fire away. And so, so when we're talking about when, when this was introduced back in 2015, right? It it wasn't about density. It was about providing homes for our mother-in-laws or child dependents. That that was the discussion, correct? It wasn't about housing density. We didn't have that discussion back then. Is that correct? Would that would you? Yes. Yeah, so I mean. Sure. Very similar to what my colleague has mentioned with having a, a person who owns a home and might want to have his mother-in-law move in with him. Yep. And that's why there was a restriction of two people, correct? We didn't want to make it too big. We wanted to make it for the mother-in-law or the dependent child or someone with a disability that needed to, and some codependent. So I, that's what I remember it, and that's yeah, what so I've been hearing. Yeah, that's probably a good yes, idea, Mark. People at home are wondering what wisdom yeah. that you're expounding <laughs> from <wisdom>. the audience. <laughs> so I recollect at the time, I mean, there, there was a lot of discussion about what's the best number. You know, is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Um, at the time, you know, we didn't allow for ADU. So, I mean, and the planning commission is like, okay, we're going to do this, but we're going to be cautious. Okay. So... And, and that's where we landed at, too. And, and certainly the thought was, you know, perhaps we'll be a little bit more cautious than we would need to be, but let's get into this. Let's see how it kind of um, unfolds, you know, with the city because there was a lot of thought of, okay, God, if we do this, we're just, you know, there's going to be 50 of these things, like, overnight. It's going to be bam, bam, bam. It didn't happen that way, obviously, because construction costs are so high. Nobody, it doesn't pencil out to do them. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about the density, and we just thought, well, let's let's see once how it plays out. And, you know, as years go by, perhaps we can loosen it up. Perhaps you want to keep it the same. So yeah. th there was a lot of discussion about density, but we landed at two, and we thought that that was a prudent number. Right. Yeah. And so we are going from the maximum of two people up to potentially up to four people living in, in one of these units, correct? Potentially. Yeah. Thank you. This question's on. Any other questions for staff? All right. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. What is the pleasure of council in regard to uh, the proposed text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance UDO Round 7? Move we adopt the recommendations as presented. Moved by Hookstra. Is there support for the motion? Support. Support by Peters. Any discussion? I'd like to make a motion to amend. The current motion and what would that motion to amend be uh, i'd like to amend it by um to to accept the tech the text amendments as presented to exclude or remove any items or changes to items e3 e5 and letter g um, which is redundant under section 39-9 uh, uh, point zero seven accessory dwelling units ADUS. Okay, there's a motion to amend the motion. Is there support for the, the motion to amend? Support. Support by Bird. Discussion on the motion to amend. Can you be a little more specific about what we're taking off instead of using the numbers? I'm not, I need a little. I need a little help here. Yeah. We go to that page. We're ready for discussion, right? Yes, we're discuss. Yeah, we're discussing the amendment to the motion. So what I'm asking to be removed is really the changes, all the changes to the ADU with the exception of um, item 6C, really. Item 6C is kind of just referring to uh, parts of the ADU that's reflective of, of what's required and what's not required inside ADU, correct, is what you said before. It's just a clarification, a, a clerical error or a clerical change. Okay, so everything in what I've mentioned 
is to have it removed from said motion. Dave. Again, just to clarify your motion, um, so you're suggesting that everything related to ADU, um, the uh, change in square footage from 300 to 200, the, the percentage, all of that would be deleted? That deleted, just Are, not changed, not changed. Okay, so the, not to okay. the changes. So the changes would be deleted, it would be? Yeah. Refer now back to the, the changes, original yeah. language. All right, I understand. So removing any changes to e, items E3, E5, and G under section 39.-7 or-9.07 assessor dwelling units ADUS. Yep. Lynn, did you have a question? Not a question, a comment. So it seems like all along we've been doing UDO changes. This is number seven. And what the staff has indicated to us as we make these changes is that in utilizing the document, they're finding that there are changes that need to be made. Like there are changes that make it easier for developers, make it easier for residents to do things to their properties that they want to do. And and this, I think, is a really good example of that because at the, at the Neighborhood Improvement Committee, there were a couple of people who were actually utilizing the ADU ordinance and attempting to make it work for their families, and it didn't work. And so they were recognizing that they weren't the only ones, probably, for whom this wasn't working. And so that, that's where these proposed changes came from, that, that for them, the, the UDO wasn't, um, wasn't working. It's not to say that every change that's requested to the UDO we accept. We've, we've already indicated one where the Planning Commission said, you know, we understand that that person would like to build an ADU, but we don't want to get into the Hope, the Hope District. How do we stop? Where's the end? So we've had some, we had conversations about that. There were a couple of recommendations. I think Steve um, referenced them that there were people who wanted to include detach, a, attached ADUs to this recommendation and the Planning Commission said, that's a bridge too far for us. So this, I think, as Jay mentioned, was a really thoughtful process through the Neighborhood Improvement Committee and I think makes a lot of sense the original um, ADU ordinance was kind of a, attempted to be a one size fits all. And this allows for some flexibility. And, and, I, and I'm not just, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not just using words. <laughs> like it does allow for some flexibility without expanding it drastically. And, and so I think, I think the recommendations are reasonable and, um, and, and keep the idea of an ADU as, the, as a place for family members to live, for, for, for um, mothers-in-law and you know, whoever. I, I just think that it's a, that it's a, it's a, a, reasonable, a, a reasonable change. Tim? I'm just wondering, Scott, if it would be different if it didn't say just for people, but for related people, like if it was a family, to get to the points that you're talking about, Lynn and Jay, if it's a family, say a mom and dad that are looking to move into this place versus for college students, for example. Yeah, we, we actually had some discussion about this at the planning commission level, and, I, and my understanding is, my, my recollection is, we don't have that related people language anywhere in the code because it gets into some really sticky areas in, term, in terms of determining whether somebody's related or not. Uh, but we did have that discussion at the planning commission level specifically. Well, I, I would just say I find it interesting, this came before us two weeks ago, we were told we need to put it on to the agenda for a vote, if you will, and this is our last opportunity to withdraw anything that's in there. And so this is our last opportunity really to have debate mm -hmm. before we take a vote. That's not normal. Um, 
Well, that's what that's yeah, what we're doing right now. Yeah, we could always we're table doing right it. Now, yeah. but we had very we had no debate at all. So it was brought to us even without any consideration in, a, in a, even a study session. We didn't have, even have a notice of this in a study session. Yeah, we we right? actually did discuss this. I believe in so, a study. Maybe I've heard it too many times. Maybe now, but I think but that we did have this in a study session at one point. My point, point is the public yeah. has listened to this multiple times about density inside residential areas, and that's exactly where we're going with this. This is the one step that's been taken by the community neighborhood improvement uh, community excuse me neighborhood improvement committee when they know very well this was a big discussion that we've had through the udo process for nearly a year and this was a lot of people speaking up loudly that they did not want this to happen and we're going back down that path again and we're not talking maximum two people we're talking a maximum four people an additional car that's going to be available it's basically duplexing our residential neighborhoods again. And again, I, I will say for the record, we've been down this path before. People have spoken loudly about this. In less than a year, we're bringing it right back again. It's just like we don't <coughs> really accept what the public is telling us. And instead of just like tabling, like taking this off and have a legitimate debate by this council, a lengthier debate about what the uh, Neighborhood Improvement Committee had or the Planning Commission for that matter had, I just don't think it's it's a fair approach to um, to to uh, to approve this, Mr. Freeman. Then I just have a, co a conversation or a question. If we're approving this latest motion, we would approve all the changes that he's, the planning commission has proposed, the staff has proposed, minus this one. If if this if this amendment to the motion passes then we are back to the original motion, less the language that's here, and then we would vote on that particular motion, okay. unless someone chose to make it a further amendment. And then this one can go back to Planning Commission or wherever it needs to go to come back or die or whatever it is. Absolutely. Okay. Well, go ahead, just Len. to clarify that, does it die or does, do, can, we, can we at the same time send it back to the Planning Commission? What's the, what's the, what, what's the procedure there? Gonna like, is it worth it? I, 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 mean, I mean, I think it's worth. I think it's worth it to the neighborhood improvement committee to continue the conversation. Um, I'm just not sure how that, that works. And that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to pose it to Vince, but I'm, I'm thinking there's not any requirement that it has to that we have to send it back to planning commission or neighborhood improvement commission because this actually originated at neighborhood improvement committee. They could present something different different to us. Uh, planning Commission or through they could make a different recommendation to Planning Commission Planning Commission could then make a another recommendation to City Council but we don't have to request that they do that they could choose to do that on their own the same way they did with this am I correct on that Vince I think you are they, they would be informed obviously by whatever action council takes in this proceeding um, to exercise their duties uh, as they see them um, and if they but again, if they're not, they don't take action or they don't take something up, the council certainly can direct that studies be done, investigations be done as well as necessary. But you're right, they would be informed by whatever happens tonight. Okay, thank you. Ms. Coronado. Um, I'm going to speak up because I am in the process of building an ADU. And um, so I have a four bedroom home, and um, nothing is stopping my son and daughter in law from moving in or my daughter um, and her boyfriend, they're related. And um, with housing being so expensive, um, and I never thought to have my son and his girlfriend move in with their child until this started, this new development of the UDO. But I guess, I guess it's hard to wrap my head around, um, with all due respect, um, Councilman Corbin, they can live in my house and still it's going to be another car that lives there. I mean, even if we have adult children that live at home, there's still another car. I mean, I know blended families, adult children, costing, cost of living on their own is expensive wherever. And I, I guess I resonate with um, Mr. Peters about, you know, it's, it's still our, our home and we're not just having anybody live there it's generally family members in-laws um you know i'm getting up there in age too you know someone to be there with me um but i i guess 
it's still within the coordinates of the UDO and they're still related. I think when I talked to the department, they were like, well, you could either have an Airbnb or a accessory dwelling unit. And I chose the accessory dwelling unit because I have plenty of space um, for, you know, if I get older or my, you know, somebody comes home, then I still have the single space not attached to the house where I have my own space or whatever the, you know, however that it worked out. But I guess whether the density comes, it's still families because of everything being so expensive, housing, food, gas, everything that it, I mean, that's how we grew up. I mean, 10 of us in a two bedroom home, um, families, extended families, you know, all live together to make ends meet because of, you know, we're just trying to make ends meet um, in that regard. Um, so I guess I come at it from a different perspective and yeah, you know, there's still, the UDO helps us, you know, guidelines and, and, and you know, to keep everything on the straight and narrow, but it, it just, I guess I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around um, that you're talking about the density, but it's, if it's relative or family, I mean, they could all be in one house versus the UDO. I, I guess I'm just having a hard time with that. So hope that came across clear enough. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any other discussion on the amendment to the motion? Mr. Bird. Yes. Um, I, you know, there's Tim asked a comment about uh, parents. Um, currently, this does state that there can be two people, and also for Belinda, there, there. There's an allowance of two people in there, maximum. Um, I guess, when, when did the Neighborhood Improvement Committee discuss this? Over the last 12 months, wouldn't you say, roughly? Yeah, Mark, Mark. Let the main guy talk. Yeah, Mark Cornelis, you made. Let the main guy talk. Our, our um, liaison to the Neighborhood yeah, Improvement Committee. I'm gonna guess that we started talking about it last August. And we talked about it for about four meetings. No, it would have gone farther back than that. Mm -hmm. Maybe May, June, July, August, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It was, it was a conversation that took over about, again, four or five meetings, picking apart different pieces of it. All right. When did this get discussed uh, on Udo? I think it first came to the Planning Commission in October. So after it made it through the NIC, then it um, came to the Planning Commission. I think we discussed it at a study session, maybe mm -hmm. two. I think two, two different study sessions we and, talked about uh, it. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, let, let me clarify. When did this initially get talked about in Udo? When this arose, when we had the community involvement? Do you remember that date? As, as far as during the original UDO process? Yes. That I'd have to. That was over the course of, that was about two years ago when we were in the thick of the UDO conversations. It, 2021. Yep. Okay. To my understanding, the only change that was entertained in the, in the original UDO conversations was pulling it back from uh, requiring um, the Zoning Board of Appeals to review every request. They eliminated that. Other than that, I don't believe um, there were any recommended changes other than that one. Again, I could be mistaken, but there weren't any full-scale large changes to the ADU ordinance in the, the, the movement through the UDO process originally. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the reasons um, that we came on the number that we did for the people allowed in there were based off of what uh, Scott Corbin or Councilman Corbin stated, and that's for family members, aging parents, and um, family members who were physically challenged. Um, I don't know the exact amount of hours that was put into this, but there were quite a few hours put into this. A lot of hours on council members deliberating, um, a lot of time with the community involvement and community coming in and speaking as well. I have a problem supporting the original, um, but not a problem supporting the amended. And the reason is because all those people came and spoke. 
right? All those people came to multiple meetings. Those people came, when I say those people, I'm talking about our community. They came, spent their time here hours on multiple meetings. And now we are, I guess, changing what their desire was. We're up here to represent the individuals in our community. And for me, I don't see them coming up saying this is the change that we want. They were very adamant about not having these kinds of changes. So for me, um, it's, it's a no brainer. If I'm going to represent my community, I'm going to represent what their desire was two years ago. I understand the work that has gone into um, the neighborhood improvement community or committee the last year or so, we'll say. But there was a lot of work that was done prior to that. That's why I asked those questions. When did the neighborhood improvement community or committee talk about it? And when did we talk about it during the UDO process? So with that being said, I, I will be supporting the amended and not the original. Any other discussion? Uh, yes, Ms. Yeah, Raymond. I just have a Miss Raymond? Ms. Raymond. When have you ever done that? I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to be an equal opportunity <laughs> using first names and last names interchangeably. Just throw it out there. So what's the so right the way it is right now, if we wanted to vote no on the amendment, then we go back to the original? What's then the, the original motion for the entire package of changes. Okay, so I'm so if the at some point I can vote for the other changes if this is removed. Then. Absolutely. The only thing we're discussing now is simply okay. uh, Mr. Okay. Corbin's amendment to remove the changes related to accessory dwelling units. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes, Ms. Coronado. So I wasn't here at the last when the UD, UDO um, discussion happened. So the constituents spoke that they didn't want the UDO, but we still went ahead with the UD, with the um, ADU. I'm sorry. They said they didn't. They there was opposition to certain types of accessory dwelling units. What what we I'm sorry. Yeah, I go ahead, Quincy. Right yeah, please. What we currently have right now is what the community requested. To have ADUs. Correct. Okay. Changing it would be against what their desire was. But 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 we, but we just heard that in the last seven years, there's only seven. Is that correct? Correct. Um, so I guess I'm still confused that they didn't want. They didn't. They did want ADUs, but they want them as as it is now without as these. With the current correct. Okay. Yep. So ADUs were part of our ordinance before the unified development. They were. There were some, yes. Okay. There were some recommended changes during the UDO process, and a, a, there was opposition to any changes to the existing ADU ordinances. Because they thought that it was just going to create the density. There was a lot of, there, there were people concerns. had different, reason, different oh, okay. concerns about it, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. But again, in the last seven years, there's only been seven, and mine's one of them, and it's, okay. So I guess it's still... We we're hoping um, to have more, but there's not. Um, me being a resident of Holland in my neighborhood 20 something years, I guess I still, I, I, I'm okay with the amendments. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm okay. Thank you for the clarification. Any other discussion on the amendment to the motion? Yes, Mr. Hookstra. <laughs> Um, first of all, and I don't know if this is particularly germane to the, uh, to the amendment, but, um, we're elect, our purpose here is to serve the greater population of the city of Holland as best as we can in a way that serves the greatest amount of good to the greatest amount of people with the least amount of hurt. And sometimes that means um, adopting and going along with a popular opinion, and sometimes it means going contrary to it. And we've experienced both of those. So 
I just wanted to get that off my chest that of what our purpose here was. So you can just throw that away if you want to. But and I guess the other thing that's on my mind, uh, and I appreciate the concern that I'm hearing about you know whether we're honoring the intent of those that we represent. Um, my uh, former comments notwithstanding, but I'm wondering if we're trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. I know that we create these things with uh, a long-term impact in mind that we don't want to come back every couple of years and say, well, things have changed, we'll change it again. Um, but seven units in seven years doesn't really impress me as an epidemic, if, to put it in those terms, or a, or a huge trend. Uh, I think it, it's probably serving the purpose that was it naturally is going to, to serve. Uh, I don't think that we're going to get a huge number of increased um, spaces for people to rent through this process. Um, so I guess I'm not really feeling the uh, the angst or the the severe need to, to, to make this change. I suppose, you know, if we find something different happens, if we do have a landslide of, you know, if we have 50 applications in the next two years, I guess we'll have to revisit it. But the other changes that are proposed here seem very prudent to me, um, and I would really not like to throw those that baby out with the bathwater. So I guess my point is here, um, while I appreciate the sentiment that the amendment amendment was made, uh, I'm inclined not to go along with it. And that's all I have to say about that. Mr. Corbin. I just want to clarify a question that Councilman Coronado had, whether or not she can continue to do what she's doing and other others likewise can continue to do what she's currently doing. And that's affirmative. You, you and others can continue to do what you're doing in the current uh, ordinances so it's not prohibiting you from doing that nor anyone else from doing that so just want to affirm that and and councilman hookstra you're correct we're here to serve everyone as much as we can and sometimes we have to make that decision you know of what is best because we're hearing we're listening and we should be listening well all right but, you know we introduce pizza right planning incentives help me out um Planet zoning best. zone abate. assessments and abatement yeah so you know, we've done a lot of things for housing in this community, a lot of things, not only us, but others as well, right? Nonprofits, um, builders, uh, just we have done a tremendous amount of work, not only in the city of Holland, but elsewhere. So we've made a huge dent in this, but to take what someone, and not just someone, many people have voiced their opinion about over and over again during the process, about ADUs and taking away more residential properties and enhancing them in the way that, that was recommended through the Udo process, they spoke very loudly and very plainly that they did not want that to happen. And to ignore the community, I think is just, is, is, is probably not in good spirit of when they came and spoke to us about and we voted those areas out. We, we didn't accept those things. And the, to reverse that with less than a year, I just, I don't find that acceptable. Any other discussion on the amendment to the motion? I've got just a couple of comments. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank the Neighborhood Improvement Committee for bringing this forward because that's their job to do that and for the good work to do that and to keep an eye on what's going on in the communities. I. When I this came to us at the Planning Commission, I thought almost exactly what Mr. Corbin just said. Wasn't it less than a year ago that we had this as a, a contentious issue in front of council and in front of Planning Commission? I sat through hours of public comment. I said, answered dozens if not hundreds of emails and had conversations about this. And accessory dwelling units were one of the most contentious parts of the accessory of the of the Udo process, um, and I'm an advocate for for accessory dwelling units. I think I wanted every bit of the recommendation from the Planning Commission in regard to accessory dwelling units that was part of the Udo to pass, but we heard very strongly from our from our constituents that that is not what they wanted to have at this time. Um, 
I think this I think this discussion that we're having and this process is a great example of good process and good governance. This is what we're here to do. We are here to have our neighborhood improvement committee make recommendations. It's our it's part of our process to have the planning commission take a look at those recommendations, refine those, make recommendations to us, but ultimately we are the decision makers in this type of thing for the people that elected us to do this job. Um, and as somebody who is an incredible advocate for accessory dwelling units, I want to make sure that we do this right and we do this with the full community's involvement and support and engagement in the process. And I feel like doing a change this way after a short time ago, we were told loudly and clearly by this community that this that they did not want an expansion of what we've got in regard to accessory dwelling units is not doing the process correctly. I wanna see accessory dwelling units. I do, I, I think they're great. But this is, in my mind, this is not the way to do it. Um, and so I'm going to be voting no on this amendment. Any other discussion? Otherwise, I'll call, call the question on the amendment. Yes, I do. Mr. Clarification. Porter. If you vote no, you're accepting. So if you're, voting, if you're voting yes to the amendment, you're voting to remove the Correct. accessory dwelling unit language. If you're voting no on the amendment, you're saying that you would like that accessory dwelling unit language to stay. Correct. <laughs> because you said okay so if you're voting yes on the amendment so if a yes vote on the amendment is to remove the accessory dwelling unit language did i say that wrong yeah. i apologize i apologize <laughs> thank you for catching me on that it's easy enough as it is, right? yeah <laughs> yeah so voting yes your vote at, at this stage voting yes is to remove the accessory dwelling unit language voting no is to say that you would like to keep that accessory dwelling unit language in there any other comments or discussion, Mr. So, Burt? So we're saying a, a yes vote is to keep the OODLE updates minus the OODLE. All we're, all we're talking about right now is whether we remove the UDO updates from, from what we've been given so far. All then right. we'll have a second vote on, okay, on the full package of them, whether that includes the accessory dwelling unit language or it doesn't. But a yes vote now for this vote says, pull the accessory dwelling unit language. Okay, right. is that clear for everybody? As mud. Okay, and I said it right I, I that time, right? <laughs> Thank you, all right, yeah. Some, way, sometimes the words way. come out of my mouth and I'm not li not paying attention to myself. Kathy, would you please no, call the roll? No, oh, 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 I'm sorry, sorry before sorry. you do that. I know, you usually Ms. talk Ms. Last. Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to, this is, uh, I think the, um, the thing that strikes me about these recommended changes is the idea of we had a lot of conversation at the Neighborhood Improvement Committee about what a family is. And the, the, the two um, folks that, well, actually, one of the, the people that, was, that, that brought this to the attention of the Neighborhood Improvement Committee had adult children with a baby. And in, in this situation, I think we talked about this at the last meeting, in the situation, the way that it's set up right now, they would not be able to, to house their family in an, in an ADU. And I think that's a that's a pretty that's a that's pretty important to think about um, who how this will affect uh, people going forward. We've mentioned several kinds of family members, but I think this was a really I, that I thought was really striking to me. Um, so that I hope that if the amendment passes or whatever is removed, we can have a conversation about sending this back to the Neighborhood Improvement Committee to, to keep having conversations about it. So my question are, so if I have aging parents <coughs> that I need to take care of, I can only have one live in there? No. You can have both of them in there? Okay. Um, That's the current yeah. standard, yes. Okay. You can still do that, yes. Okay. So if I vote no, that means I want to go ahead with them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead with the yes. amendments. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. No, you want to go. You want to go ahead and with the accessory dwelling unit language included in the changes. Yes. Okay. A, I'm not sure she, a no. A no vote on the amendment says that you like this language that's in front right. of you. That's clear to everyone. Okay. I want to make sure everybody's clear on exactly what they're voting on in regard to the amendment. Any other discussion on the amendment? All right, Kathy, would you please call the roll on the amended, amendment to the motion? Vreeman. 
Yes. Peters? No. Corbin? Yes. Coronado? No. Hookstra? No. Raymond? No. Bird? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Four yes, four no. Turning to the city attorney. Uh, I'd say the motion failed for not having five votes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you for that clarification. So the motion fails for for lack of a majority. Is that the okay? So we are back to the original amendment uh, that includes all of the changes that were proposed and recommended by the Planning Commission. Any discussion on the full motion? Seeing none, Kathy, would you please call the roll? Peters? Yes. Corbin? No. Coronado? Yes. Hookstra? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Bird? No. Freeman? No. Mayor Box? Yes. Three no, five yes. Motion passes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda uh, is item 12E 6.1 gifts. Kathy, would you please review the gifts for us? The city manager's office is pleased to report the following gifts. Parks and Recreation Summer Concert, Ser Concert Series 2023, Barber Ford, Inc., $3,000. Public Safety Services, Police Operations, 11 officers donated $770 to purchase Honor Guard flags. It is recommended that these donations be accepted with appreciation, credited to the appropriate account, and an expression of gratitude be forwarded to said donors. Thank you, Kathy. What is the pleasure of council in regard to the gifts? Move to approve said gifts with the token of our appreciation. Moved by Coronado. Is there support? Support. Support by Vreeman. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, next item, 12E 6.2, resolution approving ballot language for proposition to authorize the sale of 255 Collin Park Drive and 64 Pine Avenue. Mr. Van Dyken. Thank you. I'm going to quickly turn this over to, to Mr. Coster. This, as a recommendation, comes to you, to you through the Holland Board of Public Works Board. I believe Ron is in the bullpen if there's any legal uh, questions, but Dave, please, please. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. It's great to be with you and uh, kind of stepping in here a little bit for, for Keith because while the Board of Public Works did you know, take up a resolution, this is obviously uh, a joint effort in uh, the furtherance of our work on Waterfront Holland over many years. And uh, as, as you know, in study session, we spent a good amount of time um, with a lot of consultants and staff uh, that have supported the process of first development of a vision and guiding principles along our waterfront. And then secondly, um, the move forward on looking at the catalyst property of the James D. Young plant as a uh, opportunity uh, to invite development into that waterfront area, which over the years led to um, requests for qualifications among developers and then ultimately requests for proposal that's been under consideration for the last year. And at the study session, we reviewed a lot of information over about 51 slides, which I know are in the slide deck tonight, but not to go through those in detail. But just to summarize that uh, what you will find in that slide deck, and that slide deck also is on waterfrontholland.org for those that were following along there or would care to look at that, was a careful review of how well this proposed development by uh, Geenan de Kock, GDK, um, uh, uh, which would require a swap of properties, a movement of the Verplank operating uh, entity, which operates an aggregate uh, 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 transportation and um, a logistics area at the end of 8th Street onto the James D. Young site so that a mixed-use development could occur at that location there, consisting of hotel, restaurant, uh, ice cream shop, promenade, cruise ship dock, transient marina, and a lot of ability to access uh, the water, along with um, opportunities for amenity improvements at Collin Park, which are part of that uh, proposal as well. 
Um, we reviewed, uh, I should say, uh, Mr. Vanderplug and his team and also representatives from uh, um, uh, Hari Khan, for example, who was involved as one of the consultants on uh, uh, the development of Waterfront Hound Vision, reviewed that and found that to be very well in alignment with the principles and uh, or the guiding principles and the vision associated with uh, Waterfront Holland and moving it forward. Uh, we also had consultants in from Hitchcock uh, Design Group and uh, S.B. Friedman who together have helped us through the proposal uh, period and together um, have evaluated the both indirect and in, uh, direct and indirect economic benefits that accrue to the community through the development that's there and those were highlighted in the proposal. Also, uh, with the help of Ryan Kilpatrick, uh, there's been a lot of review on mechanisms that could be put in place to fund some of the public infrastructure qualified improvements that would necessitate or the ability to or bring Verplank, uh, that would be necessary to bring uh, Verplank to the DeYoung site, as well as things that would be associated with the development at the end of 8th Street. And uh, those essentially comprise a couple of uh, TIF districts, tax increment financing districts. And S.B. Freeman also evaluated the potential in terms of that to generate enough revenue to fund those. And that was shared that the estimate is around $35 million uh, over a 30-year period of time. And so uh, some really good opportunities within that. A lot of work has been done, but there's a lot of work yet to do. But where we are at this point, what was also shared at that study session was that a term sheet has been developed. It's a non-binding term sheet, and uh, Mr. Vanderveen is also here today to help with any questions that you might have with respect to the term sheet. Uh, again, that being a non-binding term sheet would form eventually a f uh, the basis for a redevelopment agreement, which would become more of a binding uh, document. Still may have some contingencies associated with that once it's executed, but one of the primary contingencies is that by the charter language, it requires a vote of the people, a 60% positive vote, to sell both utility property as well as waterfront property. Uh, and so what the ballot language that is for, in front of you tonight, and the Board of Public Works did review this and recommend its approval to you, would be that that ballot language would, um, and through the resolution that's attached in your, in your documents, uh, would ask the council to um, approve the ballot language and then submit it to the clerks of both counties of Allegan and Ottawa, which would seek the ability to be enabled, essentially, to sell properties at both um, 64 Pine Avenue as well as the parcel at 255 Collin uh, Park Drive. And so I think with that, that kind of summarizes where we are and with the amount of information that was contained in the uh, prior presentation, anything that the council has with regard to those questions or anything on the term sheet, I think all of us here would be happy to answer your questions. Great. Thank you, Dave. Any questions for staff? Mr. Hoekstra. Yeah, as I understand it, there was a revision to the, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a site plan, but the, we'll call it the, the, the site vision, okay, uh, from the original one that reflected some thought on the how appropriate or not appropriate it was with a larger vision is that right can someone the movement in, in essentially the review that as it was first proposed there was not as good of alignment with waterfront hounds vision and guiding principles but then in review with the staff and uh, with the consultants that revisions to the proposed uh, concept um, you know brought it further in alignment with that yeah. and that was the that's very review. well said yeah so that was true <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. absolutely okay. so I'm just yes. This is, this is going to another questions or statement sort of, but can someone briefly describe what, uh, what triggered that or what um, changes were made that brought it more fully in alignment with the vision? Yeah, and maybe if, uh, if you want to go back to the slide for Mark and he can come up and represent mm -hmm. that, yeah. that'd be great. Got to put my thinking cap on for a minute, a minute and uh, think yeah, what, what they're all changing. <laughs> so I think that there was another one, Matt. Yeah, that's the revised one. Okay, so there um, some big changes with this is that uh, with the revised plan, there was much more detail um, about um, waterfront access and getting down to the water and where, where uh, people were going to be um, 
allowed, the public would be allowed to go at all times. Um, there was some further definition and kind of, I think they lost one or reduced one of the buildings. They kind of separated the buildings a little bit better to allow some more view corridors through there. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, that, that's true. So the traffic pattern was also better. Matt, if you can, I'm sorry, who's ever doing that? Yeah, so big thing here. So if you see the triangle, the triangle little parcel there that's owned by the city. So there, the original concept plan had that as being just a parking lot, okay? And how the plan evolved here, it's really kind of being looked at um, kind of around that triangle area have parking there, but the, but the actual area itself kind of remained um, being a park area whether it's public or private, I guess, to be defined yet. Uh, but that would be a green space area. And we were really kind of felt that would be more respectful for the historic district that is just on the other side of the street on Knight Street. Um, so a lot of things there. Um, additionally, um, yeah, this, this shows there's kind of a parking lot then. I think the first edition showed that it was all kind of parking between um, that triangular area and the waterfront property. This now shows that there is going to be, it's kind of a parking lot, but there's going to be circulation going through there. Um, so cars could continue to do that, as well as the all important uh, parade route. Um, so they wouldn't have to kind of, you know, go down Washington Avenue and kind of do these angle things. So you could still have the parade route going through there. So those are some of the, the major items, but there was just a lot of good tweaking that went on with that that really kind of brought the overall assessment for one of kind of characterize it as a good start you know um, with the plan they came out with a, a little about well, about a year ago to where now we're thinking yeah this is really getting pretty closely aligned with uh, the guiding principles and everything else that we yeah. came up with so it's 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 there, okay. So obviously there's a lot of work. I mean, if this, if you approve this tonight, and if and if the um, the voters vote for it, it still has to would have to go through the entire kind of permitting process and, and the plan development review process with the planning commission. So there would undoubtedly be even further refinement um, and work on it too. And then we'll get the formal input workshops with the neighborhood and everything too. So it would continue to evolve, but we think just further refinements and getting better and better. Well, I appreciate uh, that description and reaching back into your memory to, to come up with that reasoning. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to get into the weeds too much or into making sausage here, because as you say, that comes later. But it, this all, it sounds to me like we're talking a lot about access and um, the aesthetic quality of the area. And that's important, I think, because um, as we bring this to the <coughs> voters, one of the things I've been hearing, and this I guess goes to a previous point I made about w how much we listen to our constituents and so forth, but um, what I'm hearing, and if you look at the citizen survey that was recently made available to us, what is reflected in there a lot is a desire for people to be able to access the water. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a weird uh, uh, phrase because it can mean a lot different things mm. to different people. Some people want to fish, some people want to look, some people want to, I don't know, throw a tube in or something, who knows what. But the, the sentiment seems that people want to be able to connect with the water in an easy way. Um, I hear things like, well, let's not make it just for the rich people, you know. Um, they want it accessible, they want it um, broadly available. So. As we bring this to the voters, I hope that they will hear and understand that um, this version, and, and certainly the, before we get to the final version, um, that um, accessibility is something that will be built into this with great intentionality, and that that's we're not just selling out, you know, to the fat cats here because we can. Um, we're not keeping it as a park because it would cost too much to do that. Uh, there are great reasons for development like this in terms of revenue and that sort of thing, but also we're keeping in mind the, 
the needs of the of the citizens of this town and their ability to connect with the water, um, which is why it's so difficult for us to get rid of property because it has that much value. So I appreciate uh, you speaking to this. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Are you all good too, Dave? Yes, sir. Okay, and both Daves, either Dave. Any Dave, By the way, any other Daves nice, in the room? That's a really nice shirt. All right. <laughs> Uh, what is the pleasure of council in regard to item 12E 6.2? Move we approve. Moved by Hookstra. Is there support? Support. Support by Coronado. Any discussion? Ms. Raymond. Yeah, I think it's just, I've been having conversations with people about this, and I think it's an interesting, like, kind of fine line to walk because we need to know what's happening on the property we what's proposed for the property um, but at the same time really what we're asking is just selling this piece of property right like that's just it's it's really the first step it's helpful for people to know what's proposed for the property but that this is the first step and i and when i think about in terms of this particular step does this make sense for the community it, if that was the only question, I would be answering, I'm, and I'm answering, I will vote yes on this wholeheartedly. But if it was just that question, I would still do it wholeheart wholeheartedly because I think that's what makes sense, is that is, is having that piece of property available for development. Um, so, you know, I, think I live in that neighborhood and I think I have no access to the water right now. All I can do is walk down the street and look at Verplank's big pile of, of gravel. And thank goodness we can come up with a solution that allows them to continue with the work that they're doing and then and, and provide something new for, for, um, for the city and residents. And, and I really appreciate the changes that Dave, has, that Dave um, uh, noted earlier, uh, significant, really significant changes that they made from the first proposition to this one and looking forward to seeing how that evolves going forward um, and what the neighborhood involvement will be about that. So. Any other discussion on the motion? I've just got a couple of comments. I agree with almost everything you just said, Lynn, except for two things. Um, I know, I know. One, um, this isn't the first step. This is the next in a long line of steps. Um, another example of, in my mind, good process and good governance in a completely different way. Um, we started this process five years ago. Um, a, a lot of public engagement, a lot of public meetings. We got a lot of input. Um, when Dave was asking about the question about the alignment to the vision, that vision came from the people of Holland. They were the ones who told us what it was that they wanted. And our job was then to try to take that vision and work with developers to see if there was a viable option that aligned with that vision. Um, and I've heard some of those same voices saying, hey, why don't you just do a park? We don't have enough park space. And my initial gut reaction to this, there's a big park right next door to this space. And that's my other disagreement with you, Lynn. You do have access to the water right next to this spot at Collin sure, Park. I was thinking about that space. Yes, at, that, <laughs> at this space, there's currently not. Um, and Dave, uh, Dave Hookstra is exactly right. We don't have the resources to turn this into another park or an extension of Collin Park. That's just not going to happen. But this kind of development gives us the opportunity to not only enhance this space, but through that thing that I'm sure everybody who's listening understands completely, tax increment financing is going to give us the access to some resources that we would not have otherwise. And we we're discussing, we've been talking about tax increment financing in a lot of different ways, and it's simply the idea that this land right now is worth a certain amount of money and it's taxed based on that value. <coughs> After this development occurs, the value is going to go up dramatically and there will be an increase in the amount of taxes that we collect. And what we're going to be able to do is capture some of that increase in those taxes and be able to use it not only for this, but also for the possibility of other amenities in and around the water. And so it not only open up, opens up the opportunity for the development here, it opens up the opportunity for other great things for the people of Holland, which I think is one of the genius ideas behind this proposal. And Lynn, I agree with you completely. If we are only doing one thing tonight, we are taking the next step and asking the people of Holland whether or not they are interested in taking the next step with this. 
Um, our waterfront resources are really, really valuable, much more valuable than just about anything we have. That's why it's instilled in our charter that we're not allowed to just sell this property. Um, if you were paying attention on consent agenda, we actually approved the sale of a lot of things from Windmill Island today. You know, it's, but, but we don't ask the public to vote on whether or not we should sell a wagon with a wood stove on it at Windmill Island. We're, we have the authority to do that ourselves. But because our waterfront property is such a valuable resource and something that we can't get back, we need the people of Holland to, to approve of that sale with not just a simple majority vote, but with a 60% vote. And if that were the only thing that we were voting on tonight, I would say absolutely 100%. I'm 100% behind this. But also, I've spent a lot of time looking at all of the different iterations of this plan and how that aligns to the vision. And I've said before, I was a simple citizen five years ago in that community engagement and outreach process. I had a hand in saying what I thought was important. And this really aligns really well with what that vision of the community is. And, and is this the same as what we have now? Absolutely not. And that's one of the things that I really like about it. It provides, as Dave said, you know, what does access to the water mean? We have lots of different ways to access water in Holland right now. We don't have this kind of access to the water. We don't have the ability to be able to walk along and see the boats like they do in Saugatuck. We don't have the ability to be able to get an ice cream cone and sit and watch the boats come in and out. We don't have a kayak launch right off of downtown. This provides new and engaging ways for the people of Holland to be able to access the water. Um, and I could not be more excited about this. Kathy, would you please call the roll? Corbin? Yes. Coronado? Yes. Hookstra? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Bird? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Peters? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the item that was removed from the consent agenda, item 12E 6.3, uh, the intent to create a neighborhood enterprise zone at 780 Columbia Avenue. Mr. Van Dyken. Uh, thank you again. That was a that was a big step in a long process, so that was a pretty exciting uh, event tonight. So. The item before you is to create a or adopt a resolution of intent to create to create a neighborhood enterprise zone at 780 Columbia. Marcus here, he is uh, very well versed in this process and is happy to explain it to you while I try to talk to you and change the slides at the same time. And there it is. So, Mark, right. please take it away. Mr. Mayor and Council, um, yes, I'll just make some introductory remarks about what the purpose of the NEZs are um, and a little bit about the process. Um, and just by just a quick uh, background, we do have four um, NEZs that are active as we speak. Um, a couple of them are several years into the process, so the Maxell Flats on 6th Street, uh, the two separate projects on West 8th, um, and then Washington School Condos. That one is, I think, in, this, in its uh, final months or at least in the last year or so of phasing out. All of these are sunsetted in terms of how long uh, the tax abatements are in effect. And then we have two recent ones that have phased out in the last couple of years, scrapyard lofts and baker lofts. So that's kind of your, your past experience with setting up uh, neighborhood enterprise zones. Uh, the purpose, as you can probably kind of ascertain from the title, is to incentivize neighborhood development, redevelopment of kind of properties or areas that are, you know, maybe have seen better days. Um, that development that might not occur without a little bit of an incentive. Uh, the process that's, uh, that, that is required to, there's two big parts of the process. One is just to establish the neighborhood enterprise zone itself. And then once it's established, then the city can entertain um, applicants who wish to have one of their properties uh, designated um, and receive a neighborhood enterprise certificate. So the process for establishing the zone uh, would begin tonight if you approve, would just be to adopt a resolution um, of intent to create the NEZ. And that just allows, I think, the clerk's office to notify the other taxing authorities that this is a, po a possibility. Um, what would happen after that is the city would take a look at that zone a little bit more closely and just determine whether it, it meets um, the criteria related to neighborhood preservation, whether it fits the master plan, um, and meets other economic development goals of the city and in that particular area. Um, eventually there would be a public hearing in about the 45 day mark um, and then after that point then council would entertain actually adopting 
um, the, the formation of the zone. So then, and again, that's kind of the larger phase one. Then we move into the opportunity then for property owners within that zone um, to request a certificate, which is another multi-part process of coming before, um, coming, to this, coming to the city, coming before council and getting that approved as you do with other kind of industrial sorts of tax abatement systems. Uh, we do have one applicant that that's, uh, has already come forward for the properties that we're looking at. Um, right in front of you on the screen, we're looking at Columbia Avenue between 32nd Street and 33rd Street. So all the parcels either face uh, Columbia with the exception of the two um, to the west on 32nd and then that one that's essentially, I think, just a parking lot on 33rd Street. So that's the zone that the city is entertaining. Um, establishing the property owner that has come forward uh, that the city's been in conversation with for some time um, is at 780 uh, Columbia that's the property kind of on the west side of Columbia uh, I, I guess it's the third property from 32nd Street he is proposing to uh, do a pretty major retrofit of the entire building so he the end product will be um, a, a commercial space facing Columbia, and then two, two residential units on the main floor and one residential unit on the second floor. But again, establishing the zone does not guarantee that he is, he is awarded a certificate. Tonight we're just talking about uh, putting on notice uh, these other taxing authorities uh, that, that this is a, a possibility. That's the background. All right, any questions for staff? Mr. Hookstra. Yeah, I, I asked to have this removed from consent. Um, I hesitate to say, but I think I've been around for most of those NEZ projects that you mentioned. <laughs> and uh, to the best of my recollection, every one of those was driven by a particular project, um, certainly a certain need um, for assistance to make those projects come to fruition. Baker Lofts, obviously, is a in scrapyard are very visible examples of that. Um, so, and we were being asked to create this um, zone, and of course, there are, as you explained, there are more steps to come in the future, so it's, you know, it's not uh, done yet. But I just wanted uh, the opportunity for staff to explain, first of all, what the project was that is initiating this process and why we're being asked to create this. But. Um, and then also to sort of highlight an opportunity there that's going on uh, in another part of our city, in another small neighborhood, but a pretty vital one. And um, I don't know all the details, but it sounds as though the end result could uh, be very beneficial, just as these other projects have been too. So primarily it was the opportunity for us to become aware of why we're being asked to do this, and also to, I guess I was curious <laughs> what the project was too, but. Uh, I appreciate that explanation. One point I didn't mention that I intended to is the abatement does not um, eliminate all of their taxes. They would continue to pay property taxes on the, the land value and the value of the property as it, as it is right now. So it's frozen right. at that level uh, throughout and, and until the, uh, the time period for the NEZ certificate ends. And I think they're permitted to be in the six to 12 year range. I don't, I don't know how that's determined. It's, I think it's determined by, by you folks um, based on the value to the neighborhood or the value of the project. Yeah, I, th I think typically toward the end of the period it's a sliding scale where it's phased back in, you know, not all at once, yep. but yeah, okay. Great, any other questions for staff? Great, thank you, Mark, yep. appreciate it. What is the pleasure of council in regard to item 12E6.3, the intent to create a neighborhood enterprise zone, 780 Columbia Avenue? Move to approve. Move by Coronado, is there support? Support. Support by Hookstra, any discussion? Kathy, would you please call the roll? Coronado? Yes. Hookstra? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Bird? Yes. Raymond? Yes. yes. Peters? Yes. Corbin? Yes. Mayor Box? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Next item in the agenda, item 13, communications from the city manager, or tonight, the assistant city manager, Mr. Van Dyken. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have a couple things this evening. Um, staff is working hard on the budget. Obviously, that is a huge part of what we do. 
Um, and currently for next week, we do not have anything to discuss on study session with you. So we'll put that out there, uh, another week off. Uh, for this coming weekend, it's cold outside, finally. It's really cold outside, finally. But thank goodness, because we have ice sculpting coming back to downtown Holland. So Friday and Saturday, it should be great weather. Sunday's going to get a little a little bit warmer, so if you got somebody that really doesn't like the cold, the sculptures should still be down there. Um, so that's exciting, and coming back to, to downtown, you just in that, bring more people all the time to Holland kind of motif, so that's exciting. Um, your next regular meeting, while this didn't come to, didn't rise to the level of being an objective at your retreat, we do have fire stations that we're gonna build one and replace the other. Uh, we expect that we will be coming back to you with bid results at your next regular meeting to award those bids for the construction of the new fire station. So lots of things going on from the financial and the uh, construction standpoint and some fun stuff happening this weekend in the downtown. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, appointments, communications from the mayor. I do not have anything this evening. Uh, so we're on to appointments, motions, communications from council members. Uh, Mr. Corbin, I believe you have something this evening. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. It is recommended that the city council accept the resignation of Candace DeBoer from the Community Pool Authority. CPA effective January 26, 2023, and the appointment of Ben Aguilera to the Community Pool Authority, term expiring June 30th, 2024. I would entertain a motion to that effect. Oh, we need a motion first. Move, move by Peters. Is there support? <laughs> Does somebody want to support the motion that support. Mr. Peters really wants to make? Support, support by Raymond. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Any other uh, motions, appointments, communications from council members? Mr. Bird. Jay, you are funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, a, a couple of things. Um, I want to remind us 3.73 is the number that is close to good. <laughs> That's the number that the community gave us as council members. Um, as we deliberate, I want us to take in mind that it's close to good and what the community thinks of us. And we need to take that very seriously. And I'll leave that there. Um, every year, first of all, this is uh, the start of Black History Month. Um, and every year for a couple of years, I've decided that I would, um, <clears throat> I'm saying um a lot, I would uh, give, <laughs> I would give some information regarding black inventors in our community, not in our community, but in our, in our country. Um, the ones that I have, I don't have a location for them. I have five black inventors in our country. George Crumb. George Crum, a chef, a restauranteur, is said to have unintentional created the potato chip during the summer of 1853. They were made in response to a customer who sent back their fried potatoes after complaining they were too thick. The crisps, was, the crisps were an instant hit and through Crum never patented the creation. Chips are arguably now one of the world's favorite snacks. And I am a potato chip consumer, <laughs> big time. <laughs> Just plain Lay's potato chips, my favorite. Uh, Grand T. Woods. Woods accumulated almost 60 patents during his lifetime, many of which improved the function of railroads. One of the most notable was the induction of the telegraph system, which allowed traveling trains to communicate with one another while also allowing workers to locate them. George Washington Carver. This is um, <clears throat> a this is a name that most people know. He he was in the peanut butter inventor. Uh, so many of us know George Washington Carver as the man famously for giving us peanut butter, and it says bless him. But he he's responsible for much much more. As an agricultural agricultural chemist. In an effort to increase the profitability of sweet potatoes and peanuts, which thrived in the South as opposed to a dwindling cotton supply, 
Carver began to conduct experiments in 1896 and created 518 new products from the crops. They included ink, dye, soap, cosmetic, flour, vinegar, synthetic rubber. He publicly revealed his experiments in 1914. And when you think about ink, dye, soaps, cosmetics, flowers, vinegars, and synthetic rubber, that's, that's almost everything we touch every single day. And that's one man who, one black man who helped actually a world thrive. Alexander Miles, and in, Innovation that contributed to saving lives was Alexander Miles' elevator design. Before him, elevators were operated manually. People had to physically open and close the doors of both the elevator and the shaft every time. Miles realized the constraint and the hazard this posed when riding on the elevator with the shaft door open with his daughter. In 1887, he obtained the patent for his invention including a, flexing, a flexible belt attached to the elevator cage, allowing the doors to function automatically. And then on my list, last but not least, is Shirley Jackson. Some of you may have heard of Shirley Jackson. Uh, Jackson is the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate degree at MIT, responsible for monumental telecommunication research that led the innovation of products such as touch-tone phones, portable faxes, fiber optic cables, and caller ID. In 2014, President Barack Obama named her the co-chair of the President's Intelligent Adv Adv Advisory Board. So again, these are things that I'm sure a lot of people don't know. Um, and we think about inventors, and we have our Edisons, we have our Ben Franklins, we have so many people that we automatically go to and think about, but <clears throat> there was a lot of black inventors that we just, I'm sure on this list, all we've ever heard of is George Washington Carver. So I'd like to take this time to present these names and, and the contribution to our everyday lives that they have given us. Great, thank you very much. Any other motions, communications, announcements from council members? Mr. Hoekstra. Yes, as uh, we may recall from our retreat recently, um, one of the things that was talked about, I brought it up and I think, um, I hope that we embraced it as uh, an aspiration is to spend some time in longer term um, visioning, if you will, viewing, sort of trying to develop um, a longer term um, view of how we see a vision how we see Holland in five or ten years. Um, the benefit being the same sort of thing that we realize having a long-term financial plan, long-term capital improvement uh, project plan, and I, I, if I'm not incorrect, I think that was received with a desire to do that. And now, we may have the opportunity next week, since there's nothing on, that staff has for us, it might be a, a prime opportunity to spend a little bit of time in doing that. Uh, I, I present it to my colleagues here to gauge their interest in that. Maybe something that uh, we could use prior to that for some preparation to look at, you know, our recent SWAT exercise and that, that sort of thing. But I also recall, I'm not sure there was resolution to this, our city manager asking us for some sort of uh, direction regarding certain things that would be helpful for staff, even though we didn't come up with a lot of concrete sort of things that we put stickers on, if you'll recall. So I'm proposing that next week might be an opportunity for us to engage in that. And I would ask my colleagues what their temperature on that would be. Mr. Bird. My temperature, Corbin. my temperature is going to be about 83. I'll be in Florida, so <laughs> I will not be partaking. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's a yes from Quincy. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Mr. Corbin. Thank you. I, I certainly enjoy the time off, but I am very much willing to, to sit with my colleagues and have those discussions. Yeah, certainly. I think that's a great and wonderful idea. 
um, if you would even produce an agenda that you could pass on to staff to make sure that it's posted appropriately. I think that would be a, a wise thing to do. Is it appropriate then to make a motion for yeah. that? I think we've, we've gotten, I'm seeing enough nods around here, Matt. We were able to, and Kathy, able to get the agenda posted that we're gonna have a visioning discussion. Yeah, I don't think it requires a motion or a vote. No. No. I don't Shall think it requires staff. We, we, we don't necessarily need staff there, do we? I don't, I would see it as an internal conversation, so probably yeah. not. So, I don't think Keith and I would miss that for the world. <laughs> You're more than welcome to attend, yeah. but I, yeah. what I'm hearing is we want to have some discussion between our colleagues and mm -hmm. come up with some ideas. Yep. All for it. All right. Great. Thank you. Any other motions, communications, appointments from council members? Entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved Move by Vreeman. There's a support. Support by Peters. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.